Now it uses the word sadafain, the two sides of an open shell like that. Go ahead. Better. There you are. The two sides of an open shell. There you are, and that's the gorge in between. Go ahead. Okay, Black Sea, Caspian Sea. Yeah, go ahead. See, we have some more. Okay, so we're here. Now, go back. Right. One of the major events of Akhirul Zaman is the conquest of Constantinople. And there's Constantinople. Mustafa Kemal insisted the name is Istanbul, and if you use the name Constantinople, you can be arrested. And the Turkish post office will not accept any mail with the name Constantinople. Because he wants us to believe, and the Ottoman Islamic Empire wants us to believe, that the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Nabi Muhammad already occurred in 1453. Wrong. The conquest of Constantinople is still to occur. And the reason why the conquest of Constantinople, Constantinople takes place after the Malhama, and maybe in the fourth session we can deal with Malhama. The conquest of Constantinople is important. Why? Because Eastern Christianity did not form an alliance with the Jews. Western Christianity did. Eastern Christianity is room of the Quran. And Nabi Muhammad wasalam, said that we Muslims are going to form an alliance with room. That alliance is important because the major force that faces Israel, the major threat to Israel, comes from Russia. The Russian nuclear powered navy is here. Russia's navy cannot use this area over here in the winter time because it's all snow and ice. So for the Russian Navy to get into the Mediterranean, this is the path. And NATO controls Istanbul, Constantinople, on behalf of the Anglo-American Zionist Alliance. And before NATO, it was the Ottoman Empire that controlled this on behalf of Britain and France. And it was the Ottoman Empire which was waging holy war on Eastern Christianity, on behalf of Western Christianity. And so the conquest of Constantinople has to take place so that the Russian fleet can get out of the Black Sea and come here to attack Israel. Hmm? So we have, I believe, established for you the geographical location of Gog and Magog a people who are located behind the barrier. Behind the barrier, on that side of the Caucasus, were the Khaza, a tribe of people who converted and became Jews. Must have been on a Sunday morning. And some of them converted from Judaism and became Christians. Must have been on a Sunday evening. So you have Khaza, you have Khaza who are Jews, and you have Khaza who are Christians. But they did not become Jews because of religious conviction. They became Jews as a matter of political convenience. So they don't particularly care for Torah and for the laws of diet and so on. So these are people who are Jews as a nation. 
but not as a religion. <laughs> huh? A nation, not a religion. These are the people who today control power in the world. Now I have to make a conf confession. In this book, I came to the conclusion that Gog and Magog are the two rival powers in the world today. The Russian-led alliance I identified as Magog and the Anglo-American alliance I recognize as Gog. I think that that is now inadequate. Rather, a more accurate analysis would be that Gog and Magog are located within both the superpowers. And Gog and Magog are taking both the superpowers to their destruction. Because when the two superpowers have already been used to serve Israel and to serve the Zionists, they don't need them anymore. And so when the two superpowers are taken on a ride until they clash with each other, with the nuclear war, there will be mutual destruction. They will be destroyed, but not Gog and Magog. That's where I made my mistake. Gog and Magog will not be destroyed by the Malhama. Gog and Magog will still survive the Malhama. And Gog and Magog are now going to use their power to ensure that Israel rules the world. And it is only when Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns which is long after the Malhama, only then will Gog and Magog be destroyed. So when you read this book, I'm going to remember, I'm going to have to put in an extra paragraph or so now to give this additional explanation. Now, uh, what's the time? How much more time do I have in this session? 20 minutes? Okay. The Prophet also spoke about Dajjal, that Allah had created a being and programmed that being to impersonate the true Messiah. They rejected him, the true Messiah, and they're waiting for the true Messiah to come. And so Allah is going to send into the world someone who will impersonate the true Messiah. And he is Dajjal. He will appear as a human being. He will appear as a Jew. As a young man who will be powerfully built and I used to say who would have curly hair <laughs> until an Egyptian came. He said, Sheikh, I'm on the way from Indonesia to Cairo and I want to meet you at the airport. So I had to take the train and head to the airport to meet with him. And this Egyptian was so excited to meet with me that he missed his flight to Cairo. <laughs> he missed his flight to Cairo. So he explained to me, he says, no, Sheikh, the Orthodox Jews have to wear curls at their side here. And that is what the Prophet is speaking about. And you see them in Brooklyn with the curls at the side, okay? So he would be a human being. He would appear rather as a human being. As a young man powerfully built a Jew with curls. And he's going to stand up in Jerusalem. I don't say he's going to appear in Jerusalem. He could appear somewhere else. But he will stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. And all those who had eyes and couldn't see would recognize him as the Messiah. He would have deceived them. His name is Dajjal because he deceives. He has a PhD in deception. 
a friend of mine got offended. He said, he, got, he just got his PhD. He said, don't tell me Dajjal also has a PhD. <laughs> so, in order for him to successfully impersonate the Messiah, he's got to rule the world. He's got to establish his power as the supreme power in the world. When he has done that, he has to rule the world from the Holy Land. Only then he can declare, I am the Messiah. A convenient earthquake will have to take place, which will bring down Masjid Al-Aqsa, and they have the power to do convenient earthquakes. And then he has to rebuild the temple. And then he declare, I am the Messiah, and they'll accept him as the Messiah. But he would not be the Messiah, he would be Dajjal. In this book, I have explained, and this is not a hadith, it's a logical deduction. In order for him to successfully impersonate the Messiah, number one, he'll have to liberate the Holy Land, which is under control of Muslims. Liberated for the Jews, that is. He's already done that. He's already done that. Number two, he'll have to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. He's already done that. Number three, he'll have to restore his state of Israel in the Holy Land and get them to believe that this is Holy Israel when it's an imposter. He's already done that. Number four, he'll have to cause that Israel to become the ruling state in the world. Israel may already be ruling the world today, but it's doing it from behind the hijab. But in order for Israel to be recognized as the ruling state, the hijab has to be moved. Israel cannot rule the world while the United States is the ruling power. In this book, I have analyzed a hadith that when Dajjal is released, he live on earth for 40 days, a day like a year, a day like a month, a day like a week, etc. And I have come to the conclusion that in a day like a year, which was stage one, he caused Britain to become the ruling state in the world. In a day which is like a year, in stage one, Dajjal caused the island of Britain to become the ruling state in the world. And so the world experienced Pax Britannica. I'm choosing my words very carefully. So you don't say to me, that the day like a year began on such and such a day. And then start mathematical calculations for me. No, I don't want you to do that. So the world experienced Pax Britannica. If you have another explanation for the emergence of Pax Britannica, do please let me know. This is my explanation. And then a day like a month succeeded a day like a year. And Pax Britannica had to give way to Pax Americana. And the United States became the next ruling state in the world with a mysterious relationship with the Holy Land and with Israel. And my explanation is that this is the Dajjal in stage number two. If you have a better explanation, I love to hear it. But there's such a profound silence from the world of Islamic scholarship. And such a profound and embarrassing silence from Islamic movements, many of which now form governments in the world. They don't want to hear the subject. It's too inconvenient for them. And such a profound and embarrassing silence from scholars who otherwise are recognized as great scholars. But if the Quran explains all things, what is the explanation for Pax Britannica? What is the explanation for Pax Americana? 
How is it that Imran Hussein, who is not an economist, who is not an, a monetary economist, no, who studied economics and studied monetary economics as part of his studies in international relations. That doesn't make you an expert. How is it that Imran Hussein, 15 years ago or more, was able to declare publicly and put it down in writing that the US dollar must collapse? I didn't say that the US dollar will collapse. I said more than that. I said the US dollar must collapse. The monetary system must collapse. And it must give, to way, give way to another monetary system. Fifteen years ago, I was talking about a new monetary system of cashless money. You can't see it, you can't touch it. Electronic money. Today, we are on the doorstep of the collapse of the US dollar. Where did I get the knowledge from? Was it a jinn whispering in my ear? Was it an angel whispering in the other ear? When will they wake up? This is not whisperings in my ear. This is scholarship. This is the application of a methodology to the sustained study of Akhiru Zaman. That's where I got it from. And so as you study the subject of Dajjal, you'll understand political history. And you'll understand economic history. And you'll understand how to respond. I'm only introducing the response now. In the next session, we'll speak more about the response. Dajjal is about to move to a day which is like a week. And in that day, which is like a week, Israel has to take over from the United States as the next ruling state in the world. And they ask me, how can little Israel rule the world? And I say to them, you dumb, dumb. Is there any American politician in the ruling state in the world today who has any kind of a hope to win an election if he stands up against Israel? Eh? You dumb dumb? Israel controls the United States of America. And the president of Israel, or the prime minister, Ariel Sharon, he said that. We control the United States. He said it publicly. So it's not little Israel. It is the Zionist movement, it is the Anglo-American alliance, which is now a Zionist alliance. It is Gog and Magog. They are the ones who control power in the world and they are delivering to Israel the status of ruling state in the world. In order for Israel to rule the world, it has to rule over the Arabs. And so you had the first Arab Spring a hundred years ago. You've got to study history. This is not the first Arab Spring. The first Arab Spring was 100 years ago. And that first Arab Spring eased out the Ottoman Empire and brought into being client states that were overtly client states. Saudi Arabia, who will now control the heartland of Islam on behalf of the Zionists. It brought into being governments and rulers who now acted on behalf of the Zionists. The second Arab Spring is doing the same thing. The biggest obstacle in the way is Syria. And the most important plum in the whole basket is Syria. <laughs> is Syria. And uh, in order for them to rule the world, they got to rule over the Arabs. To rule over the Arabs, you have to decimate the Arabs. You can't have so many Arabs, there are too many Arabs. And so, Wailul Arab, min sharrin qadik taraba, said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, woe unto the Arabs 
because of a great evil which is going to come upon them. It's close. Gog and Magog. And he prophesied that the Arabs are going to be wiped out by plague. So biological warfare. The Arab Spring is meant to lead to the Arab slaughter. So you'll have a manageable Arab population in the world. And when the attack on the Arabs take place, the biological one, the only place where you can find safety is in Mecca and Medina. Because neither the Jal nor play can enter into Mecca and Medina. Hmm? When Israel rules the world, it will be for a day which is like a week, a short period of time. And that will be the time of the most intense oppression for Muslims. At the end of that day, which is like a week, we're going to experience the emergence of Dajjal in person. But before Dajjal can appear in person, two things must occur. Before Dajjal can appear in person, two things must occur. Number one, the Malhama, or the Great War, which will make the First World War and the Second World War look like a fight over peanuts. So great will that war be. And after that, what's the next one? What comes after the Malhama? The conquest of Constantinople. And after the conquest of Constantinople, then comes the Khuruj of Dajjal. Dajjal was released in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. Gog and Magog were released at that time. Dajjal was released at that time. But Dajjal is not in our world of space and time. But now after the conquest of Constantinople, Dajjal will have his khuruj. So you're going to see him in person, Mr. Dajjal himself. Hmm? At that time, Medina will be attacked. Dajjal is going to land outside of Medina, in sun, salty marshy land outside of Medina. Meaning the Israeli armed forces are going to attack Medina. And at that time, Medina is going to shake three times. And every kafir and every monafic will be thrown out. So they're going to be kofar <laughs> in Medina and munafikun. And they're going to join the Dajjal. The dal. And the angels are going to bar Dajjal from entering Medina and divert his attack to Damascus. And when Dajjal reaches Damascus, then the three main actors of Akhir Zaman will all be together in the same geographical location. Number one, Dajjal. Followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan wearing their Persian shawls, says the Hadith. Number two, someone whose name I have not mentioned so far, Imam al Mahdi. But I do have several lectures on the topic, and we have them right here. Imam al Mahdi. And he will be inside the masjid, and Dajjal will be outside. The time of Salat. The first time the Messiah came, Allah appointed someone to positively identify the Messiah. Who was he? John the Baptist. The second time that the Messiah comes, Allah appoints someone to positively identify him. Who is he? Imam al-Mahdi. John the Baptist said, here he is, there's the man you've been waiting for, this is the Messiah. Pointing to his cousin, Nabi Isa Imam al-Mahdi is about to lead the Salat. 
when Dajjal comes, um, Nabi, Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes down. Comes down from the sky with his hands resting on the wings of two angels. And as he comes down in the masjid, the Imam will say, this is the son of Mary. This is Nabi Isa alayhi salam. History repeats itself, positive identification. And then the Imam will invite him to lead the Salat. And he say, no, you've been appointed by the Jama'ah, you lead the Salat. And he will pray with us in accordance with the Sharia, which came to Nabi Muhammad It is after the Salat is over that he'll say, open the gates, because the masjid is barricaded. And Dajjal is outside. And Imam al-Mahdi is inside. And Nabi Isa is inside the three main actors of Akhiru Zaman in one place. Damascus. So the story of Damascus is not going to end with some foreign armed, foreign armed and foreign finance people overtaking the country on behalf of the Zionists. The story of Damascus will end only on that day. As he opens the gate and Dajjal sees him, Dajjal is going to melt like salt melts in water. And he's going to flee. Running. Today they're stamping their feet on the earth. As bloody oppressors. But tomorrow they're going to be running. <laughs> yes, tomorrow they're going to be running. So good news for Gaza. Hold on. Tomorrow they're going to be running. And Nabi Isa alayhi salam will pursue him and overtake him in a place called Lud and kill him. It is my opinion that when he is killed, he's going to pass into non-existence. Because he was programmed to act as he did. So he doesn't have to stand before Allah for judgment and to answer for his conduct and to be rewarded or to be punished. No, because Allah created him as a special creation. An evil creation to test mankind and to punish mankind. How do we respond to the awesome facade of Gog and Magog? And how do we respond to the oppression of the job. My answer is, you can't beat them. This is a sinking ship. They're taking all of mankind down with it. And if you're on board a sinking ship, and you know it is sinking, and you cannot prevent it from sinking, what do you do? Do you collect money and build a million dollar masjid? Huh? <laughs> no, if you on board a ship and it's sinking and all those who go down with that ship are going into the hellfire, you can't prevent it from sinking. Then the only thing that a sensible, intelligent person would do is to get off that ship. And that's what the young man did in Surah al -Kef. It is a philosophy of withdrawal from a godless world to preserve faith. Let us end now with the hadith. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, there are some who would have difficulties with the Prophet, you know. Why did he say this? Why can't we be a part of mainstream society? What's wrong with the blue jeans, Jamaat? Hmm? Yes. <laughs> So, why did he say it? But this is what he said. He said, the time would come when a believer, in order to preserve faith, would have to flee to the mountain sides where rain falls and take with him some sheep and goats, which means withdrawal from the godless world to preserve faith. This is our response. Those who choose to remain in the cities, you must know that every city and every town is going to be destroyed. Suratul Isra. 
and those which are not destroyed are going to be punished with terrible punishment. We say withdraw to the remote countryside and build small communities of people who worship Allah with sincerity in their hearts. And we call that the Muslim village. Before I end, I want to introduce Roland, who is somewhere around. Where are you, Roland? Stand up, Roland, let them see you. This is Roland Hashim. He's the head of the Muslim village in Malaysia. They bought land already in the state of Pera. They already cleared the land, they already built an access road to the land. And they're soon going to start construction of the masjid. Alhamdulillah, I'm proud of them. The Muslim village will unite our people. So no sectarianism. No. The Quran and the Sunnah will unite our people. I have much more to say on the subject, but that will be in the next session, inshallah. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim wa tub alayna ya mulana inna ka anta tawab rahim. Barahmatika ya rahmatika 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 ya rah